So, welcome to History 115, the first part of world history. And we're going to go right back to the very beginning, to what's known as the prehistoric period. And that kind of raises the question of what exactly defines history, right? I mean, you know, what defines history in the sense that if we go back far enough, we have to refer to that period as prehistoric. And ultimately, probably the simplest definition for history is what we understand about the past based on written records, right? That is pretty much the core basis of the historical record. And as we go along in this course, we'll, we'll periodically discuss how historians use written documents. But if you go back far enough, right, we come to a period before written records, and, and thus we have the term prehistory. Uh, so there are other sources of information that, you know, even later on historians will continue to use. But if you go back far enough, you have no written records. What we know then is based primarily on the archaeological record, right? The physical remains left behind uh, related to human activity and so forth. And, you know, when we think of archaeology, kind of the study of ruins, the remains of cities and so forth. But it could even be simpler structures. Uh, even the remains of what people ate, of uh, what they hunted, and so forth. Uh, one other source of information sometimes to kind of bolster what we're able to learn from the archaeological record is what we call ethnography. Uh, in this case, ethnographic comparisons. Ethnography is uh, the, the kind of the main approach adopted by anthropologists, more specifically cultural anthropologists, when looking at present day societies. All right, so it's kind of describing cultural practices and so forth. So sometimes uh, if we're looking at a present day society that from a technological point of view would seem to resemble what we're able to piece together about the past, uh, you know, we, we imagine perhaps it can tell us something about how past human beings operated, right? So we call it ethnographic comparisons. Uh, in particular, we might look at modern hunter-gatherer cultures. And, you know, we're kind of guessing, right, making, uh, presuming perhaps that there, there is some resemblance between how they behave today and how past societies during the prehistoric period uh, behaved. Of course, this can be very problematic, you know. So what is problematic about this? And if we were meeting in person, I would ask uh, students to, to make a few suggestions uh, along this line. Uh, the main thing here is to really understand that you're guessing. Right. Just because uh, there are certain kinds of patterns of behavior in present day hunter gatherer societies doesn't necessarily mean that they pertain to the past. The most obvious one would be, for instance, assumptions about gender roles, uh, th that men, for instance, are hunters and women are gatherers. And we might find present day societies where that's the case, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the case in the past. So. You know, we're, we're going to really kind of go through the prehistoric period rather rapidly. That includes also kind of basic information about the evolution of man. And just to be clear in this course, we accept evolutionary theory as it applies to humankind. Uh, even though we use the term theory within science, that really just simply refers to the fact that you're talking about a complex phenomena involving many variables. Uh, in other words, scientists accept evolutionary theory as fact. And as pertains to humankind, well, probably uh, it would make sense to begin with the earliest human-like creatures that we're aware of based on uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the fossil record, but also based on archaeological information. That would be Australopithecines, who inhabited roughly East and South Africa, and is a very basic technology, right? They basically use simple stone tools but this does pr provide a kind of archeological basis to what we know. Uh, and that's going back a long, long way, right? Uh, so the first creatures that really start to look human uh, and in some ways defined primarily by the fact that they walked upright would be Homo erectus. And you know, Homo referring to man, erectus simply the fact that they were standing on two limbs, right? Walking on two legs and they emerged around 1.5 million years ago it's kind of interesting though not really a lot changing in terms of technology tools are a bit more sophisticated uh, but really very very basic 
and not that different from what Australopithecines were using. And then finally, around 250,000 years ago, we see Homo sapiens, and that would pretty much be us. Uh, though we can divide Homo sapiens into two different groups, around 100,000 years ago, it would appear they split into Homo sapiens sapiens, shall we say, really us, and Neanderthals. Uh, and so they kind of cohabited the globe for a while. Uh, and then Neanderthals eventually became extinct about 30,000 years ago. We don't know for sure exactly what happened, but the likelihood is that Homo sapiens sapiens killed them off. So it's kind of a competitive relationship. Uh, though we do know that they could interbreed. And in fact, there is still kind of a residue genetically of Neanderthals in humankind, right? So there's a pretty good chance that many of us have you know, kind of a, a smidgen, shall we say, of Neanderthal in our genetic makeup. So very often when we talk about the prehistoric period, uh, we break it down into two major eras based on technology, and that would be the Paleolithic Age, uh, literally meaning kind of Old Stone Age, uh, and then you have the Neolithic Age, New Stone Age. Uh, so right there we understand uh, that we're talking primarily about stone tools. Right, Paleolithic age. Uh, if we look at the, you know, the broad history of humankind, that that basically covers the bulk of it. Roughly 99% of human technological history, from about 2.5 million years ago to roughly 10,000 BCE, uh, that is the Paleolithic age. And I, I always find it quite fascinating to realize how little changes for such a long stretch of time, right? From 2.5 million years ago to about 10,000 BCE, meaning about 12,000 years ago, right? Really not much changing in terms of technology. Uh, but from that point on, then something does begin to change, right? With the Neolithic age. And so sometimes we refer to this uh, kind of change or transformation as the Neolithic revolution. Uh, but from that point forward, things are going to really start changing very rapidly, right? Uh, so Neolithic age kind of marked by uh, the emergence of farming, right? Uh, and eventually ends with the development of metal tools. And that will mark the beginning of the Bronze Age. And I should note, like, you know, when we talk about things like the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and so forth, uh, not all happening at the same time across the globe, right? I mean, one part of the world might, might have made the transition to Iron Age, another might still be in the Bronze Age, and yet another uh, not having developed metal tools at all. Uh, and it, even in some cases, maybe skipping over the Bronze Age straight to the Iron Age. But that does give you kind of a basic idea about the overall pattern. Uh, now, beyond the kind of stone tools they use, it, it would seem that uh, you know, for much of the, uh, the Paleolithic uh, period, uh, Paleolithic age, primarily we're talking about hunter-gatherer societies, right? Where humans, they hunt for wild animals, for, for meat, uh, and gather food, firewood, and materials for tools, clothing, and shelter, right? And we're pretty sure, too, that it was, you know, as far as like hunting, uh, hunting wild animals, uh, we're talking primarily smaller animals, uh, and or scavenging the remains of larger animals that have been prey to, you know, big cats uh, or wolves or something like that. Uh, there is a tendency to characterize men as hunters and women as gatherers, uh, but we really should be clear again, this is basically by, you know, on the basis of ethnographic comparisons with present day hunter gatherer societies, and there really is a major assumption being made. In this regard. In fact, I would even say that it, it also reflects, uh, you know, certain ideas we have about gender roles within our own society that we take for granted and might kind of color how we look uh, at the kind of archaeological and fossil remains uh, with respect to prehistoric man. Now, as I mentioned, uh, probably the, the first major transformation in terms of technology is defined by the Neolithic revolution, which takes place between around 8,000, 7,000 BCE. Again, you know, depending on what part of the world you're in, uh, which kind of brings up another point. As far as we can tell, uh, when this transition to farming 
uh, takes place in different parts of the world. It, it doesn't seem to be a case of one part of the world borrowing it from another. It seems to be kind of an independent development in every case, uh, which kind of really makes it interesting that it's kind of happening during roughly the same time, uh, time period everywhere. Uh, so the main thing is that we see the development of farming, meaning right food production instead of food gathering. You're now growing, uh, you know, what is the uh, kind of principal basis of your diet. Uh, and it varies depending on what part of the world we're talking about. It might end up being wheat, barley, millet. Uh, if you're talking about the Americas, potatoes and corn and so forth. Connected with food production, i.e. farming or agriculture, uh, two other developments we find. Very often it does seem to coincide with the domestication of animals. Uh, thus we uh, see kind of the development of a steady source of meat and milk, uh, also fibers for producing clothing. Uh, so between the two things, agriculture, domestication of animals, no longer necessary to move around, right? Hunter-gatherers, uh, you know, to a large degree, they have to go where the food is, right? And that means that they really can't settle for long in one particular location. So now we see the beginning of permanent settlements. We might consider two examples of early uh, Nithiolithic period settlements, farming villages, uh, one of which still remains, continuously settled from that period right up into the present. And so the inhabitants of that city very proud of uh, belonging to what some would say is the oldest still existing uh, city slash town in the world. And that is Jericho, uh, adjacent to the Dead Sea, very nearby. Lowest point on the planet is an oasis town, so in a very arid environment. We can see that on the left. Uh, in case you're wondering exactly where that is, I would put it uh, in the Middle East, very close to Jerusalem. Uh, actually, about a half an hour drive. I've had the pleasure of going there a number of times. Uh, the fact that it has been continuously settled means it's kind of uh, difficult to get a complete archaeological record of what it looked like back in its original incarnation. It's been built over so many times. More useful in that regard is Chatel Huyuk, which is in modern day Turkey, which, you know, is a very early Neolithic period settlement. Uh, but then at some point abandoned, right? So when they found the archaeological remains of it, uh, largely undisturbed and pretty much showing us what life was like back in that town. So what do we know about village life during the, uh, you know, the time of the Neolithic Revolution? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, a village back in that day uh, would have been you know, a village, right? It wouldn't have been uh, as big as a modern day town in the United States, certainly not a city, talking about roughly 6,000 inhabitants. But for that period, that would have been quite large. Uh, houses tend to be made of whatever material is handy. In this case, mud brick, which would then be baked in the sun. Uh, the houses were built very close together. So there are very few streets. People mostly move from one home to another uh, by exiting or entering through the roof making their way across the rooftops and so forth. Uh, why it was organized this way, uh, one has to speculate, but perhaps it was for the, the purpose of, you know, for defensive purposes, easier to defend the village. Uh, and finally, we have evidence of a kind of emerging division of labor, right? So, you know, rather than everyone growing their own food, you have uh, certain individuals in the village responsible for growing the food for everyone other individuals then able to devote the, uh, themselves to very specific kinds of uh, occupations or crafts, for instance, becoming artisans, maybe specializing in making weapons and jewelry. Uh, and finally, we have evidence of trade, right? Uh, in some cases with points quite far away, and very often you can tell that something came from a distance because either the material it's made from is not available where you found it, uh, you know, the nearest point might be three, 400 miles away, uh, or something about the design indicates that it came from a different place, right? So we have uh, evidence of trade taking place at this point. We might even have evidence of religion, but we have to be careful here, right? Uh, so for instance, we find uh, what appear to be religious shrines housing these small figurines of what might be gods and goddesses. A uh, very typical kind from this period would be what, what often... Uh, archaeologists refer to as a Venus figurine because uh, kind of very much emphasizing the parts of women 
large buttocks and breasts, maybe symbolizing fertility, you know, maybe having some kind of religious purpose in that regard. Uh, other statues might be kind of more unique to the place they were found, like the ones we find in Ein, uh, Ein Grazel, which is very near Jericho, dating from about six, uh, 6500 BCE. Uh, I say we have to be careful because at the end of the day, we have no written records, right? We have nothing that really clearly indicates uh, what the purpose was of these figurines. And, you know, for all we know, they, they might have been in some cases toys or... Uh, you know, just maybe uh, strictly for the sake of art, for decorative purposes and so forth. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's not unreasonable to assume that they might have served religious purposes as well. And in fact, we, we might have evidence of religion dating back even further, right, to before settlement. So, for instance, you have the Chavot Cave in France, very famous for the cave paintings that we find towards the back. Uh, again, does this mean that, you know, prehistoric man, even prior to settlement, had religion? Very difficult to say, right? I mean, for all we know, you know, rainy day, nothing better to do. You're in the back of the cave, uh, just entertaining yourself by making paintings. Uh, it might be you're just painting, you know, kind of scenes of your surroundings. And here we see, you know, kind of uh, what appear to be t uh, big cats or bears, maybe wolves and so forth, uh, might be telling a story. Uh, on the other hand, some of the images we find would seem to be half man, half animal. And that, that does kind of, uh, you know, maybe suggest at least a kind of spirituality or a belief in mythical kinds of creatures. But at the end of the day, again, we have to be careful. Uh, certainly, if we're talking about the Chavot Cave, we have no written records that you know provide information about the exact purpose of these paintings one other kind of possible evidence of religion dating back a long way would be burial of the dead right so by the late paleolithic period uh, humans do appear to be burying their dead we find in fact evidence of this practice in some places dating back over 100,000 years but again does this mean they believed in an afterlife you know, I mean, obviously, if you have dead bodies, you have to do something with them. You certainly don't want them lying around attracting predators and so forth. Uh, it might be just a way of kind of honoring someone, uh, but it could indicate a belief in the afterlife. Sometimes there are certain artifacts that are uh, buried along with the dead body that suggests possibly a belief in the afterlife. It could be utensils or something of that nature. Uh, but, you know, then again, it might just have been someone's favorite weapon uh, or just a way of kind of honoring that individual. So we don't really know at what point we have religion. By religion, I mean kind of, you know, a kind of organized set of beliefs and practices, right? Not just simply believing that, you know, maybe something happens to you when you die. A uh, better term for that might be spirituality. Uh, eventually, we will have a clear indication of religion. And in fact, the first reading you're going to get kind of discusses the relationship between religion and the beginning of civilization. And that brings us to the emergence of civilization. And we might start by defining our term. What do we mean by civilization? The textbook definition, uh, you know, the danger with these kind of definitions is, you know, very often you read them and, you know, you might even memorize them, but you don't really quite understand what it is that it's saying, right? So, you know, but we can start with that. A complex culture in which large numbers of humans share certain common elements. That does sound kind of vague. More specifically, in most cases, uh, if we're talking about a civilization, to start with, it is usually urban-based, right? We're talking about cities, not small village settlements or even towns, right? Very often we find that there is a very distinct kind of hierarchy or structure religiously with priests, politically, with kings, militarily, with commanders of armies and so forth. And finally, uh, there often seems to be some kind of you know, kind of material economic underpinning that generates enough wealth, right, that they're able to build cities, build monuments, uh, you know, to build up large armies and so forth. And very often, you know, there does seem to be a social structure kind of linked to that, right, organizationally, right? So for instance, uh, 
you know, not just small farms, but a very kind of large scale agriculture that might invi involve irrigation and thousands of of peasants, farmers, maybe slaves who are working in the fields and, and therefore there needs to be some kind of authority uh, kind of organizing how that all works. So another way to think about you know what constitutes a civilization is is to look at the early civilizations where you know there's really little debate that well yes this is a civilization and they do seem to share certain common elements for instance there's almost always large-scale agriculture. That would always seem to be the kind of economic, economic foundation of the civilization. Uh, we find that in almost every case you have a rigid social hierarchy, uh, very often kind of breaking down into three different levels. An upper level where you have kings, priests, bureaucrats, uh, i.e. the people who run government, and warriors. A middle level made up of freed people most often engaged in farming or artisanal crafts and so forth. And then finally, uh, and unfortunately, it does seem to be a common social group throughout much of history. You have a lower level made up of slaves. So having said that, we should be careful not to imagine that slavery as an institution in every case resembles slavery uh, as took place in the early history of the United States, which probably is the worst uh, manifestation of slavery in history, right? So very often in other societies, uh, you know, slavery was not racially based or confined to a particular ethnic group. Uh, it might be the case that slaves actually had certain rights that they weren't seen simply as property, though usually that would be one aspect uh, of slavery. Uh, and very often there might be a certain degree of mobility, the, uh, you know, like people moving into slavery because they fell into debt or then uh, you know, being freed, moving out of slavery. Um, so, I mean, I just wanted to kind of make that one caveat. Finally, with pretty much every early civilization, and this is also why it now becomes history, we see the development of writing, right, where we now have written records. As far as we can tell, uh, writing primarily, at least early on, for the purposes of keeping records, right? So it does seem now that, uh, you know, in terms of kind of the organization of different kinds of activities, uh, there's so much going on that you need to actually have formal written records to keep track of it. Writing eventually being used also for artistic and intellectual activities, certainly religious activities and so forth, but again primarily it would seem initially for the purpose of keeping records. Now as far as why civilization developed, Right. And, you know, actually you have kind of the passage of a few thousand years between the uh, Neolithic Revolution, early settlements, and then the emergence of full blown civilization. So, like, you know, why did things carry on for a while without too much change? And then all of a sudden uh, you see, you know, this kind of major transition to large cities, kind of, you know, much more hierarchical uh, social and political structures and so forth. Well, the truth is we don't really know. Um, you know, because you have the beginning of written records kind of taking place right after this event, but we don't really have any really kind of hard core evidence that makes it clear why this transition happened. So there are a number of theories. You know, one is that, uh, you know, in, in each case, some kind of challenge forced human beings to combine their efforts and to de de develop this kind of higher level of coordination between large numbers of people. And then that just kind of spurred on the development of cities hierarchies and so forth. Another is that food surpluses eventually led to a division of labor, right? And so, you know, increasingly you had like a smaller number of individuals devoted to producing food for a large number of people. Related to that, the development of bureaucracy, bureaucratic organization. Uh, and we're going to talk about that word bureaucracy in the future, but, you know, the simplest definition, we're talking about the actual people who physically work in government and make government happen, right? And in this case, kind of organizing large numbers of people uh, with respect to different kinds of activities, economically, politically, uh, religiously, and so forth. Uh, and then finally, there are some who theorize that it might have been non-material forces that brought about civilization. Uh, for instance, the development of religion might have seen uh, you know, kind of the need for people to coordinate their activities, even while creating a sense of unity and purpose. 
Uh, and again, I would point out that the first assigned reading I'm giving you, apart from the textbook reading, of course, uh, is kind of dealing with this whole question about the beginning of civilization and what role religion, if any, might have played in that regard. At this point, then, I'd, I'd like to start looking at some of the earliest civilizations that we know about. And we're going to start with Mesopotamia, roughly corresponding to the center of what today we call the Middle East. Uh, the term Mesopotamia is actually Greek for land between the two rivers and corresponds to the territory surrounding the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Southwest Asia pretty much in uh, corresponding to territory belonging to modern day Iraq. And this was part of a kind of larger area known as the Fertile Crescent, uh, which kind of then, you know, kind of ran up these two rivers and then kind of curved down into the eastern Mediterranean coast. And basically, you know, obviously uh, called the Fertile Crescent because it corresponds to uh, a very kind of fertile uh, territory uh, where, you know, it is possible to develop large-scale agriculture in a part of the world that otherwise is, you know, much of it is very arid. In the case of Mesopotamia, the earliest civilizations will develop in the south, where the soil is very fertile, partly because the Tigris and Euphrates, Euphrates rivers deposit a lot of silt there and just kind of builds up. So a very fertile area, but also very kind of unpredictable. Uh, rivers tend to overflow a lot. Uh, particularly during the spring, but it makes it very difficult to uh, really develop agriculture on a large scale unless you can control that. And that is going to lead to highly developed irrigation systems, right? So that, that might be part of the basis of why kind of much more complex civilization emerges. But in any event, at some point, agriculture greatly expands. So this does provide the material basis for civilization in Mesopotamia. Uh, and the earliest civilization will take the form of city-states uh, among a people known as the Sumerians, who were pretty sure migrated into the region. Uh, as far as we know, it might have been a kind of peaceful kind of uh, transition. Uh, does, there's no indication that they came in and like violently suppressed anyone. Uh, but they will be uh, constitute the earliest civilization uh, in the southern part of Mesopotamia. And by city-states, what we basically mean is that in each case, each city is an independent state, right? So, you know, each city has its own set of laws, its own government, its own jurisdiction, which usually would include some of what we call the hinterland around the city, right? So the state a little bigger than the city itself. Uh, but they're all pretty much independent of one another, even if collectively they constitute a kind of unified civilization and culture. Certainly they all speak the Sumerian language. Some of these city-states, uh, in fact, are going to crop up in early chapters of the Bible. So if any of you are familiar with the uh, Old Testament of the Christian Bible or the Jewish Bible, uh, you might be familiar with names like Eridu uh, Ur, which supposedly was the hometown of the patriarch Abraham, uh, Oruk, Uma, and Lagash. As far as we can see, they were very often in conflict with one another. So from a pretty early point, we have war. War would sadly seem to be a part of civilization from, from the very beginning. So typical Sumerian city, right? Uh, well, would have been surrounded by walls with defensive towers. So, I mean, if, if they're going to be warring with one another, uh, you know, l large numbers of people would have lived outside the cities, but come within the city walls if being attacked. Uh, city dwellings, I mean, some did live in the city, built of sun-dried mud bricks. Uh, what we do see as, uh, as you move further and further away from uh, the center, uh, it would seem that people become poor and poor, right? So the larger homes for priests and officials would have been closer to the center. Uh, and then the, uh, the dwellings become smaller and smaller with very small flats for peasants uh, as you come out to the wall and then even beyond. At the very center, in pretty much every case, we have the temple. The temple is the defining structure of the city. It's what we call a step pyramid. So it's a pyramid, but with steps, not smooth sides. Uh, the actual term we use in the case of Sumerian cities is ziggurats. 
And the ziggurat, in a sense, was kind of the link between this earthly realm and the more divine realm of the gods and goddesses, right? So each city had its own patron god or goddess. And in a sense, the ziggurat was that god or goddess's home uh, on earth. Uh, and so related to that, you had large numbers of priests and priest priestesses that served the temples to ensure that the patron god and goddess was happy and would protect the city. And here we see kind of a, uh, on the one hand, on the left side, we see the actual archaeological site of the city of Ur. And then on the other side, an artistic depiction of what the city might have looked, back, uh, looked like back in its glory days. We can see the ziggurat uh, kind of, you know, off to the uh, upper left uh, right there. And then to the right of that would have been the royal palace, right? So, I mean, that would have been kind of the most prestigious, important part of the city. Now, Sumerian cities were ruled by kings, uh, and they were seen not as being divine themselves, but as representing the will of the gods and goddesses on earth. Each king was the agent of the patron god of that city, and they had absolute power over the army, government bureaucracy, and the priests and priestesses. Uh, here we see actually a royal standard of Ur, which kind of, in some ways, actually very nicely illustrates uh, the kind of hierarchy that existed where everything really kind of centers around the king, whether you're talking about uh, just kind of day-to-day -day governmental activity, religious activity, or as depicted in the bottom, war, right? Uh, we think that the kings might have uh, actually also constituted priests back at the very beginning, but then at some point there was kind of a division of labor between priests and kings. Now, from a pretty early point, it seems that the ambition of kings is to create empires, right? So for a while, these different city-states are in conflict with one another, uh, but nobody really emerging as the top dog, if you will. The first one to actually put together an empire uh, in the case of Mesopotamia was Sargon of the Akkadians. The Akkadians are actually a new people who come into the region at some point, and eventually under his rule, overrun the Sumerian city-states to establish the first dynastic empire. This takes place in 2340 BCE. What do we mean by the term dynastic? Uh, dynastic basically referring to the manner of succession, that when the ruler dies, he should be succeeded, in most cases, by uh, the most eligible male heir, usually the son, some, some cases it might be a brother, and so forth. Right, so that is basically, you know, so if you have uh, a dynasty, it basically means a ruling family, right? So individuals belonging to the same family that constitute the line of succession. And from this point on, it really does seem that the main goal is to build an empire. Uh, and in the case of Mesopotamia, nobody is able to hold on for very long. The Akkadian Empire doesn't really carry on for that long, but, you know, before too long, another city... Uh, kind of a new one on the block, if you will, the city of Babylon is able to establish an empire. This is around 2000 BCE. And that brings us actually to the first ruler of ancient Mesopotamia that I, I really expect people to remember. And we're actually going to have an exercise related to this. And that is Hammurabi. Probably best known, uh, is the best known of all the Mesopotamian rulers. Uh, so he's, this is a Babylonian ruler, but this is kind of, uh, shall we say, the Babylonian Empire Mahtu, sometimes referred to as the Neo-Babylonian Empire, i.e. New Babylonian Empire. Uh, so the first one fell, but then later on Babylon emerges again as a, an imperial power. He ruled between 1792 and 1750 BCE. And why do we care about him? Not because he created like a huge empire or he was like the most successful military commander. He is best known for the law code he established, the Code of Hammurabi. And by the way, the image that you see there is from a kind of metal, what we call metal steel, a kind of smallish monument that would have contained the law code. But at the very top, you have an image of Hammurabi supposedly receiving the law from one of the gods. So the Code of Hammurabi consists of 282 laws. 
Uh, now, it's not exactly a code of laws in the modern sense. I mean, it didn't quite function the same way. Nevertheless, it does kind of represent the emergence of a kind of legal principle, if you will, the idea that the law should somehow be consistent, right? That, you know, it should be implemented in the same way throughout the empire. And related to that, it would have been considered important that, uh, you know, the law, the code, all 282 laws should be highly visible, right? So you would have had these steels, these metal steels or smallish monuments uh, embedded with the uh, entirety of the Code of Hammurabi stationed throughout the empire where everyone could see it, right? And they could then understand how it operated. Uh, and, you know, kind of the idea that, uh, you know, the law shouldn't be arbitrary. The king can't just make it up on the spot. Uh, and related to the different laws are ideas about what should be the punishment when a particular law is, is broken. So again, kind of the idea that the punishment should be consistent. Two different individuals commit the same crime, they should receive the same punishment. It shouldn't matter if, you know, one is a friend of of an important individual or has a connection to the king, the other doesn't, shouldn't depend on the mood of the king that day, right? You know, this is the crime, they both did the same thing, should both get the same punishment. And I'm not going to say much more about it for now, but uh, I am going to ask you, uh, and so look to Blackboard for this, uh, to look at uh, a sample of some of those codes and then maybe choose a few and you know think about what they tell us about ancient Babylonian society and from a historian's point of view that might be the you know in some ways the greatest value right they tell us a lot about the mentality of people in that time uh, it tells us about gender relations it tells us about social hierarchy uh, gives us a pretty good idea of what they consider to constitute a serious crime or a more minor one and so forth uh, I'll say one last thing it's kind of interesting that some aspects of the code show similarities with the Ten Commandments from the Jewish Bible, uh, i.e. the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. Uh, and, you know, chronologically, the Code of Hammurabi precedes the Ten Com Commandments. Now, you know, if you're a religious person, as far as you're concerned, the Ten Commandments came down from God. But from a historian's point of view, you kind of wonder if perhaps uh, the Code of Hammurabi, or shall we say, uh, the conception of the law in Mesopotamian society in general had some influence on Judaic law or the Ten Commandments. Uh, and it is kind of interesting to consider that, you know, even as uh, accounted for in the Bible, the Hebrew tribes, and we'll get to this later, right, but the patriarch of the Hebrew tribes, Abraham, supposedly came from the city of Ur in Mesopotamia. So we might at least very briefly consider some things that uh, not just the Code of Hammurabi, but other uh, written sources tell us about Mesopotamian society. Uh, so what do we know? First of all, very patriarchal, right? Men dominate, right? You know, pretty much uh, men, as represented by fathers and husbands, uh, are at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, dominant in the family, dominant in society. Women, in fact, possess few rights compared to men, and children have almost no rights at all. Uh, for, as far as we can tell, you know, generally uh, perceive that the woman's place was in the home, uh, you know, at least in theory, uh, you know, because against that, we actually have uh, documentary evidence that women occasionally ran businesses or that they worked in the fields, right? Uh, so, you know, there's kind of the ideal uh, of the woman's role, but we have evidence uh, that practice sometimes deviated from that. Sexual relations definitely strictly regulated, uh, and mostly the regulation was imposed upon women. So, for instance, men permitted sexual activity outside of marriage. Women are not. Men can't really be guilty of adultery because it's permitted. Women, on the other hand, would suffer severe consequences uh, if they engage in sexual activity outside the parameters of marriage. Regarding Mesopotamian religion, well, definitely polytheistic, many gods and goddesses. Um, you know, here's the thing, right? This is where religion... Uh, if we're looking at ancient civilizations, not just Mesopotamia, but for instance, ancient Egyptians or early Mesoamerican civilizations, the gods and goddesses would seem primarily to represent the forces of nature, right? So 
it's not necessarily the case that you know they represent what's just or what's right and that if you behave well things will go will go well for you uh you know nature is fickle right unpredictable the gods are fickle too right the forces of nature are unpredictable in the case of mesopotamia extremely so right i mean you have flash floods you might suddenly out of nowhere have a heavy downpour that destroys the crops uh, you have strong, scorching desert winds that might come in, uh, you know, visiting great harm upon the community and so forth. Uh, and, you know, it was never a case that, oh, we were wicked and that's why it happened. There was kind of a recognition that the gods are fickle. Maybe, you know, for whatever reason, you know, God woke up, on, one of the gods woke up on the wrong side of the bed, just felt in a bad mood, decided to strike down a whole bunch of people. Therefore, very important to appease the gods to ensure favorable outcomes. The primary purpose of the priests and priestesses is to carry out rituals. And they just had tons of rituals that had to be carried out exactly so in order to keep the gods and goddesses happy. right? And therefore, also, they very often engage in what's called divination, trying to predict the will of the gods. right? Maybe in spite of our best efforts, you know, our particular goddess is still pretty teed off and we want to see what's coming, if it's coming, right? So, you know, kind of different conception of, of the divine from, for instance, what we find in uh, the Judaic, Christian, or Islamic faiths, right? Where we often have this kind of idea that bad things happen to you because you were a bad person, right? To give a really good example... Consider that uh, in Mesopotamian mythology, they have in many ways the same exact flood story that you find in the Bible, right? Where uh, one of the gods basically destroys all living things uh, on the planet with a great flood. But, you know, a few humans survive by building an ark and just kind of, you know, waiting out the storm. The big difference is this. Right. Uh, according to the biblical story, the flood happened because humankind had become wicked and deserved to be destroyed. Right. But there was one, uh, you know, particularly good individual, Noah and his family, uh, that in the end God saves. Right. In the Mesopotamian case, believe it or not, one of the gods decided to destroy humanity because they were noisy and were disturbing his sleep. And the only thing that saved humanity is some of the other gods and goddesses were like, whoa, you know, this is a bit extreme. Uh, can we at least make sure that, you know, a few humans survive? Because, you know, after all, we need them to worship us and so forth. Uh, so, you know, very different way of thinking about uh, the divine in this regard. Uh, and again, to remind you, right, each city state, right, has a ziggurat, the kind of the idea that is the connection between the divine and this earthly realm. The city state is a copy of a divine model an order uh, and you know hence you could say kind of the home of the patron god or goddess on earth right so here we see again right kind of a uh, a model of a typical ziggurat uh, so the ziggurat the step pyramid is really kind of a foundation for the temple the temple would have been located on the top and is of course dedicated to the god or goddess who owned the city and finally, to complete our discussion of the ancient Mesopotamians, uh, as we noted, uh, as with all early civilizations, we have writing. In this case, what's known as cuneiform writing, with the oldest text dating back to around 3000 BCE. Uh, so cuneiform is kind of interesting. First of all, uh, they didn't have paper, right? So most of the written texts we have are written either on clay tablets, right? So they, you know, they would kind of uh, imprint the writing while the clay was soft and then dry it, which is great for historians because a lot of this survived. Um, or it might be on, you know, stone monuments or even metal uh, monuments, right? But all very well preserved, right? Cuneiform refers to the kind of, you know, manner in which they made the writing. They use these kind of styluses or sticks with kind of like a little triangular point at the end. Uh, that's kind of wedge shaped and that's where the term cuneiform comes from uh, to kind of imprint symbols on clay tablets and I like to say symbols instead of letters here because they did not have a phonetic alphabet you know phonetic alphabet like the, the one we have is where each symbol represents a sound 
meaning that you don't need a lot of symbols, right? You create words based on phonetically sounding them out and then using letters, right, to represent the thing that you want to rep represent, a thing, an idea, could be a verbal action, so forth. Uh, with cuneiform writing, and this applies to whichever Mesopotamian language you might be thinking of, Sumerian, Babylonian, so forth, each symbol represents a thing, meaning you have a huge set of symbols, or if you want a huge alphabet, right? So each there is no like phonetic letter representing a sound. And so very often uh, each thing would have a different symbol, but then you might combine symbols to represent more complex things or complex ideas and actions. Uh, the main point I want to make here is uh, becoming literate and developing the ability, ability to write would have been a highly developed skill, right? So there would be very few individuals who would be uh, trained well enough to become scribes, to keep records, uh, whether you know economic records, business records, uh, religious records, uh, or you know starting to write about kind of more intellectual topics and so forth. It really would have been something uh, reserved for a small number uh, of individuals and would have therefore been something very prestigious. And in fact, we're going to stop here with this particular half of the lecture. We'll be picking up with Egypt uh, with part two. Uh, so see you there.